Hi, I'm Scott Hanselman. It's Azure Friday. I'm talking to Corey Sanders from the Virtual Machine team. So, uh, virtual machines, this is what they call infrastructure That's as right. a service? That's right. So, infrastructure as a service, or we call it IaaS in the team. Uh, no one else calls it that, but we call it that. Okay. Uh, yeah, it ends up giving you sort of that, that complete access to your virtual machine. Is it Hyper-V in the sky? Like, yeah. I get Hyper-V. Yeah, yeah. Right? No, it's a great way to, great way to think about it, actually. Um, it, it both is uh, effectively Hyper-V in the sky. You can go use it as if you were just running a virtual machine like you would uh, on-premises. And we actually use Hyper-V in the sky. Uh, okay. And Little did, do people know that uh, most of our data centers are actually in the sky, so mm -hmm. that's good. So I know that when I'm running, like I've got Windows 8 here, there's mm -hmm. a hypervisor, which is kind of like a little micro OS, and then the other operating systems sit on top of that. Yes. Are you running regular old Windows in Azure, or is it some kind of special Azure-y Windows? The underlying one is actually a regular old Windows. We, we think more highly of it than just regular well, old Windows. <laughs> I'm just saying, like, <laughs> yeah, no, it is. It's you know, uh, off the shelf Windows Server 2012, mm -hmm. uh, just running inside our inside our data center. We add things on top of it, uh, sure. you know, to be able to boot remotely from from different locations and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, but the underlying operating system and hypervisor is just yeah, what you buy on the shelf. Okay, yeah, because I want to understand that because I think that when people think about making a virtual machine, like I've got my my Azure dashboard up here, and this is with my my yeah. personal account, they want to have a sense of. What is it that I really am getting, and is you know, am I being lied to, right. for, for lack of a better word? Right, right, in right, any right. Way? Yeah, I would never lie to you, Scott. Uh, I appreciate uh, yeah, that. Yeah, that's right. So, like, if I go here to new and go to compute, yep, and I can go from gallery. Yeah, uh, I've got. These are all real kind of like pr images That's right. of, that are prepped. That's right. So what these end up being is, uh, you know, we end up having sort of our own storage account that we keep track of a set of images that either we've made or partners have made. So you can scroll down, you can find Linux ones in here as well, um, that uh, and SQL ones, the SQL team made those, yeah, Oracle and Oracle too. as well, exactly. Wow, it's, and got, so, it's got really big recently. Yeah, it did, it did. It's grown quite a bit. So these are uh, effectively just VHDs that we we keep track of in all of the regions in the world, right? Huh. And so what that means is that when you say deploy, all we do is we take that VHD, copy it into your account, and boot it from a hypervisor. Uh, and again, Windows Server 2012 Hyper-V. And okay. so uh, that, that really is sort of the simple process. We add a, it makes it looks really fun, uh, but that's pretty simple in the back end. Okay, so that's kind of interesting because yeah. I'm trying to figure out kind of the, the base Lego parts. Yeah. So you've got storage accounts where yep. you put blobs. Correct. And when I'm running a, a virtual machine, yeah. I'm running it out of my storage account. Right. And it's a VHD, just like a VHD that I would have in, in Hyper-V. Exactly. Exactly right. Yeah. And that's, you know, we do that on purpose, right? We want to make sure that those, that feels and looks and can be touched in the same way that you can touch on premise. There's a lot of touching involved here. Can I take a Hyper-V <clears throat> VHD that I have around, lying around and upload it to Azure? You sure can. And yeah. boot off of that? You definitely can. You can. Um, you know, there, the, the only aspect of that that has some caveat um, obviously, we only have one network device, uh, and we have specific sizes. And so, if you're uploading from on-prem into the cloud, uh, just taking a VHD and booting it, you know your size may change, right? You may lose one of your network devices if you have two on-premise. So there's some gotchas there, uh, but yeah, the VHD will just boot, right? We okay. just give power to it. So when you said one network device, you're saying like there's there's one brand, or there's just one physical, just NIC? one NIC inside the virtual machine. So like if you're you know if you're looking into a virtual machine, you'll see just one device that's taking all the traffic in and out of that box. Mm -hmm. If you're on on premise for, for a lot of machines that you deploy on premise, that's probably what you'd want. But there are some, you know, if you're intrusion detection devices, security devices like that, where you may say, "Oh, I have two, and then those, if you know, uh, those may not work correctly if you actually just copy that VHD up. Okay, and yeah. we'll do it. We'll talk about virtual networking. Perfect. Later on, a couple yeah, of a absolutely. couple of videos from now. Yeah. So I went uh, earlier and made a couple of virtual machines, and Great. I I run. This is my again my personal account. I've got a couple here. I've got two Linux ones here, Great. so I think yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll look at this on the big screen. Definitely. I've got two Linux VMs. Uh, this, this MySQL one is actually a Windows VM running MySQL. MySQL. Hmm. I found the Windows installation of MySQL easier. Yeah. And then that one is a Linux VM running PHP. Okay. This Linux VM talks to this uh, Windows VM. Excellent. So, so Excellent. it's using that as PHP. Got it. Now, I don't think that they're related to each other. I don't think that these two guys know about each other, other than the fact that I put the connection string. Got it. 
Right. Should they be friends or associated or affiliated in some uh, way? That's a great question. Yeah. So, you know, they can be. Um, it all depends on how you want to communicate between them, right? Mm -hmm. So, in this situation, I'm sure you're using the public IP address, right? Which is yeah, effectively. I guess so. Yeah. So, you know, you have two sort of options to connect virtual machines, right? One is that you connect them this way, where you end up spinning up a virtual machine and just connect using their public IP, um, mm -hmm. uh, which allows you to just connect these, send these connection strings and go. The other option is you actually can put them together. And so, there is sort of an experience that when you deploy a second VM, you can say connect. Uh, and when you do that, they end up being able to talk uh, in the back end, right? So it ends up mm. being not the public IP, but the back end IP. Um, uh, and the other, uh, the other way to actually do that, which we'll spend some time on, like you said in a later video, is with the virtual network. It has that same impact to be able to talk in the back end. Okay. Yeah. Would that save me money? Am I costing it myself more money? It doesn't. It doesn't save you money because it still remains within the data center. You're actually not going to pay for the egress here. It just it, because it ends up staying all in that same data center. Mm -hmm. Now, if you deployed these across two different regions, that would cost that you would money. Cost yeah, you. these are both in the West U.S. Perfect. So let me click on uh, the MySQL one, and I'm just going to go to configure here. You can see traffic. Yeah, it looks like you're using it pretty heavily here. Uh, yeah, well, it, it runs my newsletter. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I've got. You must be popular. Well, you know. I need to get on your that's newsletter. That's kind of how I roll. That's <laughs> so I've got. Uh, extra, I'm in the right place then. Perfect. This is the spot. You okay, have to sign good. Up before you leave. Perfect, yeah. Extra small shared core. Yep. That means that there's a real physical processor out there that I'm sharing with that's somebody right. else. That's right. That's okay. right. That's right. But I can go all the way up to eight cores. That's right. So the and and we recently released the A5, which is the two core fourteen, uh, and so all three of those high memory sizes. There, you know, obviously you can use them for anything you want to, but we do think they're pretty they're pretty useful for your database workloads, right? So mm. your MySQL probably would work better on this. You know, SQL Server definitely works better because the ratio of core to memory uh, is such. You know, seven to one ah. is sort of a, a better ratio than what you'd expect for just kind of like a front end where you may if you're you know if your front end is doing Doing sort of IP traffic, it uses a lot more of the core, less of the memory. Databases use a lot of the memory, and so that's why the ratio is all is all see, where it's at. That's interesting that you say. I didn't see that. Yeah. Like I saw it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and I'm like, oh, eight cores. Well, that's nice. Well, 14 gigs. Well, I don't really need. Correct. You know. But this makes sense. Correct. Lots of memory, but two cores would be appropriate in some instances. Exactly, exactly. And then the okay. price is such that it, it works out better to be able to do two cores and 14 gig if you're doing like a database. So there's some diversity there I didn't, Correct. I didn't Correct. see before. Yep. Uh, now I can click on that and say connect, and you'll actually download a, uh, there it is, you can actually download an RDP file. That's right. Same RDP file that I used to remote That's it right. into something else. Yeah. And in fact, if you want to, you can open it up with a text file and see what it actually says. It's very... Really? It's yeah, not, RDPs like, are I'm just... Not, I'm not hacking into something? No, no, I RDP that? files are just, in some ways, pretty silly text files. All right, so I'll the do RDP that. The RDP team's watching, I apologize. No, that's fine, yeah. I, with all due respect. Yeah, that's right. So I just, and I'm not going to give away some secret to the nope. people right now? I don't think so. Oh. Well, that's quite not quite not quite as impressive as I thought. It it's would not be. as exciting, is it? No, it's I really apologize. Not. <laughs> that's not I okay. set you up for I set you up for something really exciting here, but <laughs> no, I was like, okay, wow. I, I assumed it was some kind it's of some like big long uh, JSON file or yeah, something. Yeah, I don't no, know, something. it's pretty boring, huh? Okay, so I'm maybe just, we'll cut that part. No, yeah, okay. I don't I don't I don't cut <laughs> things don't on cut Azure things. Friday. Oh, if, it, oh. if it breaks, we fix it. And okay, we learn, we learn how it, right. how to fix it. All right. I didn't okay. know what I was getting myself into. No, you're you're yeah. gonna hate life after the end of this. <laughs> okay, so I'm remoting into this. Yeah. When it says stuff like securing remote and popping up different things, this is actually pretty interesting. Uh, you know what what we end up doing is obviously just the connections happening, right? It's just make connections going out to the public internet and going through that. The security that it pops up. This right. actually is a way to if you know if you're particularly sensitive about what we call man in the middle attack. That is, we generate a certificate on the VM mm. when we first spin it up. That certificate actually shows up in the portal. So you can actually go to the portal and say, hey, what's my certificate thumbprint? It, it is kind of an advanced user sort of thing, um, but for people who are particularly sensitive about this, you then know that we're the ones who created this VM, mm -hmm. right? That no one has hijacked you and spun up and set up a VM for you instead, right? And is in the middle between you and us, right? So, um, so that's kind of one, one aspect of this that you can uh, use for that security. Hmm. And that's why that pops up, right? We could have just made it an unsecure uh, VM, but we felt like because it goes to the public internet, we both want it encrypted and we want to be able to protect against that type okay. of attack. Yeah. Uh, so last question, and then we'll do another video. I want to talk about disks and yeah. how, how performance works. Two things that happened there. One, it popped up saying that it had installed updates. Yeah. Was that you, Azure, or was that just Windows getting updates? Yeah, so it's a great question. I think the, 
you know, Windows Azure, we update our images every month uh, with the goal of making sure that that first login doesn't have updates that are required, right? Mm. So every time you start fresh in Windows Azure, if you use the latest image, it won't have updates that you have to go install, right? Okay. That's kind of the goal, you sort of secure by default. If you run for a little while, though, so you know if you spun up the VM and a uh, patch Tuesday crosses mm -hmm. over, yeah, then then you'll end up seeing patches get installed for you. We actually turn on Windows Update to be installed at at uh, four ten a.m. Uh, it's actually some anywhere between three and five a.m. that we set it up. Oh, and really? So, so it, we, it's we sort staggered. of stagger it. Yeah, we do. Okay. Uh, and the main reason why we do that is so that people aren't painfully surprised. Mm -hmm. uh, and so if they have you know two MySQL set up and they're replicating, then it will be two different times most likely, right. and so the, they don't see their whole thing go down. Uh, this really does underscore this idea of infrastructure as a service in the sense of you own you're in charge. this here. Yep. So That's right. I'm I'm, you're responsible for keeping the service up. I'm responsible for keeping the virtual machine healthy. Healthy, patched. Yeah, exactly. Right. You're, exactly. you're like the neighborhood uh, mm -hmm. association. That's right. And I own the house. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yeah. That's right. That makes That's sense. Right. Okay, cool. And then and hopefully it, the dues are very, very low. Exactly. <laughs> it did pop up a qu it did pop up that I should change my password. Yeah. Yeah. Do I have to? No, you don't. It's have been bugging to. me for years. <laughs> <laughs> That's more Windows than it is no Windows Azure, I have just to no be clear. Uh, um, yeah, no, no, no. You don't have to. You know, I think the biggest thing that we do as part of password, um, we, we very highly recommend that you try and make your password as secure as possible. Mm -hmm. There, are, we have had a lot of experiences with customers who sort of use, you know, p at sign ssw zero rd, and then they come back and say, hey, my my machine got hacked. What have you guys done? Um, and so you're sort of like, well, you're you know, you're on the public internet. We're sorry. Yeah. Uh, so use a good password, um, but once you use a good password, I think it's up to you whether you want to change it, uh, whatever your sort of personal policies are. And I know you're not a very secure guy. So yeah, well, password that. one, two, three. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Exclamation point. Make sure you get that, that extra character. All right, cool. Thanks. <laughs> it's, it's Azure Friday. Check out more videos. We're going to dig into uh, disks now. Great. Thank mm -hmm. you.